This is Dr. Lisa Marie Bobby, and you're listening to the Love, Happiness, and Success Podcast. On today's show, we're talking about divorce with kids. Nobody wants to get divorced, and it is not the most pleasant topic to discuss on this podcast or elsewhere, but divorce is also incredibly real and it's common. And if you are looking down the barrel of a divorce right now, I know that you need help with this. You need guidance because this is really hard. It's a difficult experience for anyone, but it's especially hard if you're a parent and trying to figure out how to have a healthy divorce with kids involved. There are just so many things to figure out, you know, how to talk to your kids about divorce, how to separate your lives with children, how to cope parent. And then the biggest thing I think is how to meet the emotional needs of your children while it feels like your own life is kind of falling apart, you know, at least for a while. And this is tough stuff for anyone. And again, it's just so incredibly important to be talking about this so that you can get good information to help guide you through this transition. And so that's why we're talking about it on today's show. And that is why I have invited my colleague here at Growing Self, Dr. Amy Smith, to join us because she is a true expert on helping divorcing families get through this transition in the healthiest way possible for all involved. And I wanted you to have the very best help. So I have invited her to chat with us today. So Amy, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here today. Yeah, it's going to be a great conversation. And now I do, I do need to formally introduce you. And with other guests, I would probably ask them to share a little bit about themselves, but I know you are so modest and you're not going to toot your own horn. So I'm actually going to go ahead and toot that horn for you. Okay. (laughs) So. So Amy has a PhD in applied developmental science, a master's degree in human development and family studies with a specialization in marriage and family therapy. Um, She is also a university professor at Colorado State University. She's the author of multiple peer-reviewed journal articles, encyclopedia articles. Um, She is an expert on parent-child relationships. And she also is a certified family life educator through the National Council of Family Relationships. So all that to say, Amy, you know what you're talking about on this topic. Hopefully, yeah. I think um, <laughs> See, like we always tell have you? things to learn, but um, it is a you know a population, in it, an area that I love to work with because yeah. um, it's so hard to be going through oh. a divorce. It's hard to parent any time, um, and sometimes we just need a little extra support when we're going through all of those changes as well. It's so hard. It is so hard, um, and and so and to your point, especially hard when when divorce is on the table. Um, and so let's just jump jump right in to your topic. I mean, I know you're a wealth of information around how to go about this in the best way possible. And and I think on today's show, you know, we've talked a lot on shows in the past about what it's like for adults and relationships and kind of, you know, how to stop a divorce potentially or things to consider if you are thinking about getting divorced. So I would refer you back to to other podcasts on that topic. You can scroll back through our feed to to find them. But really today, this this is for somebody who has either decided that this needs to happen or who is in a relationship with someone who has decided for them that this needs to happen. And they are just so agonized about not just their own feelings and relationship, but like, what is this going to do to our kids? And how do I help the kids with this? So I think the biggest fear for a lot of parents in the situation is that the divorce is going to harm the children emotionally, relationally, irreparably. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, what, what does the research say? Yeah, so the research in this area really does show that, you know, it's not irreparable harm to kids. You know, it's hard for kids, mm-hmm. you know, anyone going through that kind of transition or there's a lot of uncertainty and unknown. And so often, you know, kids can struggle a little bit. And um, 
it's hard to go through that. And, you know, kids might have a lot of questions. It varies a little bit depending on how old they are with an older kid might have a few more questions than, you know, a one or two year old just from Mm -hmm. where they're able to have questions. But, Mm -hmm. but the, so it's an adjustment period. It's difficult. And there's research outcomes that say, and kids tend to do okay, particularly when they don't place blame on themselves for the divorce Mm -hmm. or the conflict, but when they're able to sort of recognize um, this isn't my fault that it's happening, Mm -hmm. but I'm able to know that it is happening um, and have that support through it, um, they tend to turn out, you know, okay. Um, And it goes Mm -hmm. away and they can have healthy relationships after that as well. Um, And there's actually some research in kids that says that when there's really high conflict or there's a lot of conflict going on in the home, the kids actually have sometimes better outcomes when there's a divorce and the conflict is reduced in their lives. Um, if that's sort of the decision that's happening, but really when that conflict is able to be de-escalated or there's just less conflict mm-hmm. around that, not to say divorce is the only path forward to reduce mm-hmm. conflict, but that high level of conflict between parents also has, you know, negative outcomes for kids. So recognizing there's lots of different paths forward but pass mm-hmm. forward that allow kids to know this isn't their fault, that they are loved going through it, um, mm-hmm. that they still have their parents who care about them. They still tend to turn out okay, mm-hmm. even if it's a difficult adjustment period or there's some questions or things that they want to explore. Um, mm-hmm. They still turn into good, healthy, functioning adults most of the time. That's so reassuring. Okay, yeah. so... Everybody, you heard it here from a legitimate expert that d- going through a divorce is not going to ruin your child's life or damage them forever and that it's it's going to be okay. And Dr. Amy, I did also hear you say that it is normal and expected to have a transitional period where it is hard. And I also heard you say that there are certain ideas or messages that kids really need to be getting from their parents in order to have those positive outcomes. So so let's just take those one at a time, if it's okay. I mean, what would you say is normal and expected for kids to be feeling or or going through, um, you know, as, as their parents are making this transition? Um, that maybe is some of the, the harder stuff. And and again, not wanting to talk about this to to be all negative, but sort of to prepare parents for like what they can expect and how to help. So what what's normal? Sure. It can look, um, and normal can look a lot of different ways. So I'll try to yeah, get a few right. Ideas. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I was like, what am I talking about? What's normal? <laughs> normal has a lot of variation there. But, you know, kids can, often I would say that they have lots of questions about it. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, it's a confusing thing about life has looked one way up until now. And now there's a big change in my world. And I don't know what that, I don't know why it's happening. I don't know what that means for me. You know, a lot of kids might have friends that have divorced parents and, you know, they see their parents every other week, but then they have another friend and they, you know, do summers and holidays or there can be so many questions that they have. Like, who am I going to live with? Do I still get to see my dog? You know, Mm -hmm. do my favorite toys even get to go with me if I'm changing home? So often there's a lot of just sort of confusion and questions. Sometimes those questions, um, kids often ask like, is it my fault? Like, did I do something wrong that led my Mm -hmm. parents, you know, to not be wanting to be together? Is it because of me? Um, when mm-hmm. we think developmentally, you know, kids' brains are also still learning um, that idea of self. And then how do I influence mm-hmm. the rest of the world? And um, that idea that, you know, probably I'm influencing everything that happens in the world is very developmentally normal for kids. And it can be a little bit tricky when we have that normal perspective and we're going through this big outcome to say, well, if I'm sort of influencing everything or I'm figuring that out, then probably I influenced this divorce and Maybe they didn't, you know, really at all. Um, So some of those questions and confusions and wanting clarity, there can also be, you know, a lot of grief or loss for kids of, you know, I've gotten to see both of my parents all the time and I love both of my parents and now I don't get to see them all the time or I don't know what that's going to look like and I'm sad or I'm sad that I don't live in the same house all the Mm -hmm. time if we have to move or... Um, so there can be that sort of element of loss for them too. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that makes a lot of sense whenever we have changes and changes are hard and there's that uncertainty that um, they can still be okay. And they're mm-hmm. losing 
something. So often that confusion or loss um, tends to come into play. Um, so sometimes mm-hmm. there's that, you know, kids tend to either go internal to themselves of how we see that, that can look like maybe I'm withdrawing some, or I seem more sad, or I seem, um, you know, I'm crying more, those kind of mm-hmm. internal behaviors that could maybe be a little bit feeling more anxious or can I control things or, um, and they can also have external symptoms. So that might mean like more pushback or maybe if your kid that's usually pretty mild mannered is starting to talk back a lot or really resist rules. Um, sometimes that is a really normal reaction or if we start, you know, being a little bit more flamboyant in our interactions and we'd be getting in a few more like arguments at school or more Mm -hmm. tantrums if they're sort of in that age um those would be external behaviors that also sort of saying the same thing so sort of Mm -hmm. seeing some of those changes short term um can be normal to see and wanting maybe to support your kids through that and really being able to identify you know where are those things coming from what are they feeling and help them explore that can be really helpful but it is you know normal either to see some behavior changes too at times Wow, that was that was just so much information, and and so to make sure that I'm I'm following, um, developmentally, kids are very self referential. They're, they're little narcissists. Everything is about them, right? And and so because of that, they can blame themselves or or feel like a sense of responsibility or or guilt, um, and that can be normal and needs to be really um, addressed directly. And I'm also hearing you say that because this is a, a loss, um, it they will also commonly have really big emotions. Sometimes it is sadness, but sometimes that can look a lot of different ways. Anxiety, which turns into controlling behaviors, anger, which can be difficult as a parent, um, and also withdraw uh, isolation, kind of rejection of others. And so these are just like symptoms, I guess, of these really super big yeah. feelings that are going on in kids and that they need help from parents in order to be able to manage those. Um, and, and I'm so glad we're talking about this because we're, we're both family therapists and sometimes, you know, you see kids and here come my air quotes. You can see this on the video if you're watching, but other it's audio, you can't. My air quotes is that, you know, when kids are behaving badly because they are doing weird controlling things, they are lashing out or breaking rules or being defiant or not doing their homework or stuff. Um, it can be easy for parents to like um, take a, a sort of like punitive approach with kids, like mm-hmm. the, 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 try to start managing the, air quote again, bad behaviors and sometimes miss the fact that there are big feelings, normal, healthy, appropriate feelings. Do you see that in your work? Sure. Yeah. Often when I work, you know, with families, either if I'm working with parents or a family Mm -hmm. that, you know, often we see behaviors and we want to stop the behavior because they're not working for some reason. Mm -hmm. And, but often, um, you know, if we're getting into fights or we're, um, you know, really talking back or things like that makes sense as parents we'd Mm -hmm. want to sort of stop that Mm -hmm. behavior and often those behaviors are a way of saying like I don't really know what I'm feeling or I'm feeling something big and I don't know how to express it or I'm trying to show you that I'm having those feelings Um, and either way we often pay maybe more attention to those big external behaviors but those internal ones you know sort of have the same impact of even if we're keeping it all inside so we seem like we're functioning you know, really well sometimes, um, those feelings are still all packed up and maybe a tighter little bundle that aren't coming out. But it's still important for those kids to have, you know, the outlet and the space to talk about it and to know that those feelings are okay and that they make sense. And that as parents, you know, you're sort of still there of, we care about you, we understand you can have those feelings. Let's figure out what we do about them too. So being able to recognize that it's not just the kids that act out, um, but sort of that act in too, um, both wanting that support. And sometimes it's easier to see the acting out as the problem um, right. type behavior. 
Right. As opposed to the the perfectionistic 14-year-old girl who's the, the star of the school play and throwing up her lunch every day in the bathroom, like that kind of thing. Sure. We miss that, the, exactly. the ones that hide. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So then um, that what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of the the outcome for kids really depends on the parents' capacity and willingness to be that like emotional partner in that place for kids. And so, you know, certainly, you know, a a parent could send their kid off to therapy to have that one hour a week of talking about their feelings. Or, you know, I'm sure a lot of the work that you do is really around that, you know, as a parenting coach, like helping parents learn how to engage with their children in a more emotionally substantive way. Um, Do you, and I know that this is a podcast and beyond the (laughs) scope of our 45 minutes together, whatever it is, I mean, people, you know, you you do multi-sessions of family therapy around this, but but what would be some of your um, recommendations or strategies to help parents just kind of reorient themselves um, and almost like know how to be with their kids in a way that's helpful for their kids. Yeah. I don't that know makes if I, a lot of that sense. was like very, Oh, thank you for saying that because I just felt very convoluted as that came out of my mouth. Yeah. What, do you know I what I'm it. saying? I do. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think one of the first biggest tips is to recognize that even though you're as a parent being that emotional partner, like that support mm-hmm. for your kids to process mm-hmm. sort of that recognition that it is a one way street of you're there to support your kids' feelings but your kids aren't there to support yours. And sometimes that's really hard because when we go through divorce or we're thinking about or any of those process as a person, there's a ton Mm -hmm. of feelings and lots of things that come up and we want support and validation. And that makes perfect sense. And when you're thinking of a kid that's maybe a little bit in the middle, we might want that reassurance that your kid does love you or that they want to be with you. And it's not necessarily your kid's job to give that to you or to hear Mm. the problems between parents. Um, And so wanting to be able to provide kids answers, um, provide kids information without having it be their responsibility to take care of us because it's not a kid's responsibility to do. And that's a really big burden for a kid to carry. So doing things like saying, you know, if a kid had a question, you know, well, mom and dad have decided that, you know, we're not going to stay married together. And we know that's a really hard thing to hear, but we've been, you know, trying to figure it out and it's not going to work for us, but we want you to know that we both still love you and we care about you and nothing's going to change. We're still going to be mom and dad or Mm -hmm. kind of providing that validation and information without making it their responsibility. Um, So that's sort of one of the steps is, offering that support without doing that. And the other thing is, you know, you can tell your kids that it's okay to have feelings like, gosh, you know, this is a really big change that we're going through and life's going to be different. Do you have any questions? How do you feel about it? You know, you can come talk to me at any time mm-hmm. and maybe even, you know, checking in with them about things. Of, and that's, you know, depending on the age, if we're mm-hmm. old enough to do that. But, you know, with little kids too, just that reassurance. Um that they're loved and that it's not their fault Um, and answering those questions that they have. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, if they come to you and say, you know, maybe they say, you know, I, I, sometimes I feel angry or I feel, um, you know, kids sometimes, you know, act out in their bodies. Like my tummy gets tight Mm -hmm. when I think about it, you know, that makes sense. And it's, you know, it's okay. If you're angry with us right now, we made an adult decision and that adult decisions impacting you. And you can be angry at us, but we can talk about that and it's okay to do that. So saying whatever those emotions are coming up, you know, saying goes for sadness or anything that they're feeling like that makes sense that you'd feel that way. This is really hard. Um, And then we can model those coping behaviors for our kids too. You know, what, what do we do when we're angry? Do we, you know, should we go get our pillow? We can hug our pillow really tight because no one gets hurt if we hug our pillow really tight or, Mm -hmm. or is it that, Sometimes we just need a little extra cuddle time. Should we go read a story together? Um, is it that, you know, there's also really great story books about families going through a divorce, like the things that won't change or, you know, mm-hmm. families look all sorts of different ways. 
So even having those kind of resources available. Oh. Will you send me, to, if you think about it, yeah. after we finish recording our interview, send me links to some of your favorite books and I'll include them yeah. in the show notes of this podcast yeah. so that people can can find those links. But definitely. go, go yeah. on, this is great. Mm-hmm. I will definitely send those links. Um, but sort of doing those things that make it normal um, or you know, even checking in with them. Sometimes, you know, we might have family routines, like maybe, I don't know, we have pancake breakfasts on Saturdays and that's something we've already done and you want to continue that mm-hmm. tradition. And maybe you're doing it for the first couple of times without their other parent being there and saying, you know, it's, it's a little different, you know, that we're doing this just, you know, me and you now or me and your siblings. And, you know, how are you all doing with that? You know, are we still, should we still do that? Um, so kind of checking in on where they're at of, you know, do we want to maintain that? Does that feel really good or do we need to switch to waffles and have something new yeah. and something fun? Um, <laughs> big on breakfast mm-hmm. food today. Um, but, you know, kind of checking in on, you know, what is that that's important? Um, and, you know, the other thing would be, you know, to the extent that, you know, your parenting agreement has, you know, kind of validating that, of course, it makes sense. They would still want to talk to their other parent or they still love their other parent. And mm-hmm. that makes sense. And when we have, you know, two parents that are really good, safe parents, you know, kids deserve to have that connection with both of them and they want that. And, um, you know, that kind of goes in, this is maybe a what not to do, but, you know, not bad talking their parent to them, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes not saying anything um, is better than saying, you know, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. We'll go back to that, that we learn when we're kids. But, you know, if we can't say something nice about their parent, it's, you know, don't say that they're a bad parent because what a kid can sometimes hear is that, well, if my two parents, I came from two parents, and if one of my parents I'm hearing is really bad, what does that mean for me? Does that mean I have the bad, or what does that mean? Or is, is it bad that I want connection with this person, that I still love them? So being able to sort of separate, there's the conflict between parents, and then there's the relationship between kids and their parents, and those are not the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and someone might not be the best spouse for you, or there might be lots of reasons that ended, And it doesn't mean they can't still be a good parent for your kids. So kind of trying to recognize and balance that for them as well. Wow. Again, just gosh, so much to to unpack here. So so I I heard you say that how to explain divorce Mm -hmm. to a child and how to tell your kids about divorce um, is really, it matters the way that you're describing what's happening, the way that you're communicating, that that's something that parents can do to to shape this experience for children is to get real clear and intentional about how am I talking about this. And then my other takeaway from what you said is that it's incredibly important for parents to be very actively like managing their own Mm -hmm. emotional turmoil in a way that helps them be not just emotionally present, but emotionally safe for their kids. And so like, don't send the kids to therapy. You go to therapy to figure, you know, like you have a place to talk about all these feelings of anger and rage and hurt and fear and, and that do not the one way street is mm-hmm. do not share that with your kids that it's your job as a parent to be a safe space for your children sure. to talk with you about how they're feeling and that your job is to invite that and just be extremely validating and affirming and make it okay yeah. um to do that and then i also heard you talk about um the need to be really intentional about mm-hmm. like routines and and things that help children kind of maintain that sense of, um, I don't want to say sameness, but like kind of our, our new normal in positive ways. Like this is the breakfast and dad's not here. And that's kind of weird, but we can have pancakes anyway. And do you want to talk about how weird it feels that dad isn't here? And without trying to like talk them out of their feelings. Sure. Yeah. That, yeah. That's okay yeah. to feel weird. And weird isn't mm-hmm. always bad, um, yeah. but it's just weird. Yeah. 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 Okay. And and then and then moving on, you were you were talking about um I think what is a really important topic because it's almost like, you know, there's the 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 short-term pieces mm-hmm. of 
a divorcing family, divorcing parents around how do we manage the first conversations, the big Mm -hmm. feelings that might be occurring right around the time of the separation and those first few months. But then there's also this like almost longer term piece Mm -hmm. around the family dynamics that can start to happen when parents actually don't like each other and sort of what to do with all that in a healthy way so that it doesn't begin to negatively impact the children and their feelings. And and just for our listeners, in addition to other things, Dr. Amy is also an expert on the subject of parental alienation and what all happens there. And I think we were kind of dipping a toe into that pool a little bit around what happens when parents start, you know, talking about their negative feelings with their kids in a way that's really unhelpful for the the children. I know that's a big topic on its own. Can you share a little bit more about you know what what do parents need to be keeping in mind when they are awash in big feelings that you know maybe your ex did cheat on you. Maybe they were horrible to you through the divorce and hid assets and, you know, are are demanding, like trying to litigate you out of existence. I mean, like those things happen in yucky divorces. And to be in a situation where you still need to like be fairly positive with your child about their dad or mom or whatever, like that's hard. Can you yeah. say more about this piece of the experience? Like, yeah, and it is- deal? so Mm -hmm. hard. We talk sometimes about these solutions. And when we're just sitting here having a conversation, they can sound so easy to do. Um, Like here's my step-by-step book and Mm -hmm. they are so hard to do. It's more like the first step on the moon type step-by-step book. Um, So I do just want to say that if it's not an easy thing to do by any means and, and in recognizing that sometimes we do have valid reasons why we might not like the other person all that much. And I think one thing that's important to remember is, you know, they don't have to be a good partner for you. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be the right person for you to be with. And they are always going to be your kids' parents. Like we can't change who our parents are. Um, And so a little bit of that recognition. And sometimes we have to get a little creative and, you know, what can you do? Maybe there are situations where if we're, you know, having an exchange for parents, like, I don't think I can see this person right now and have a good exchange for that. So maybe, you know, my sibling or, you know, your good friend or whoever, they do the drop off. You have a neutral person or, you know, maybe they're living with this new partner and you're not ready to see that at all. So we can't do those exchanges or drop offs at their house. So let's meet at a coffee shop and have it be sort of a neutral territory. So being able to have those like creative situations of knowing yourself and maybe you have to do a little bit of self-exploration to know those things for yourself But saying, you know, if I know I can't go into this situation and handle it well, then I'm not going to put myself and my kids in that situation. I'm going to figure it out on a creative Mm -hmm. other way to do that. Um, If there are, you know, situations where maybe there's those times where you're like, if I have to answer something about my ex-partner, I'm not going to say anything nice. You know, you could say to your kid, I'm really glad that you had a great visit with them, or I'm glad that you still had a special time with mom or dad, or that sounds like a really fun experience. I'm glad you got to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes not saying anything about your own feelings and then go have your person to go talk to it about. And whether that be your therapist or your friend or whoever your safe Mm -hmm. space is going and be like, oh my gosh, let me tell you everything that just (laughs) drove me crazy doing it not maybe, you know, outside the doorway where your kid is, where they can overhear, you know, kids are really good at hearing everything that goes on around. So, you know, finding your safe space and your safe person and being able to have all of those emotions. And in the moment, just saying like what you can say and doing what you can. Sometimes there's little tips in that too of, you know, it tends to be easier to drop a kid off versus pick them up. So you're not if one parent, you know, is posed to pick up, what if they come and you're in the middle of something or it's hard mm-hmm. or so being able to do the drop off on a scheduled time, um, being able to follow that often if we're in an area where there's a lot of contention or there's going to be a lot of disagreements, 
you know, having a really clear parenting plan about what is or isn't allowed, you know, it could be, are we allowed to FaceTime with our kids, you know, during the week? And if it is like, yes, you're allowed to have, you know, a video call every day for either side when your kid isn't in your custody. You always have that fallback plan of this is what we agreed to. And if one person's not following through on that, you have that safeguard. So sometimes, you know, it's really thinking in advance of what do I want this to look like? Mm -hmm. Um, Parenting plans can be very creative. So creating what you want it to be, with the exception of it's probably not going to be everything that you want it to be. You probably in an ideal world want your kids all of the Mm -hmm. time and for it not to happen. But thinking of those priority things and and being able to say, okay, we're each going to navigate that. Sometimes it's helpful to do a little bit of how do we effectively communicate with each other too, whether, you know, that's maybe you go work with a therapist or a coach sometime on, Mm -hmm. okay, we don't need to solve all of our issues necessarily. We've decided we're not doing that. We Mm -hmm. do have to know how we can communicate effectively in this. Can we do that? Can we at least get the skills to co-parent? Because you know, even though we can divorce someone, they're still in our life for the rest of our life because they're in our kid's life. And there's events like future weddings or graduations or all of those milestones, they're going to be there and finding out a way that we can maybe be around them without it ruining that whole event. For you, it's so special as a parent can be really helpful too. Mm -hmm. Wow. Again, so, so much good stuff. So, um, and you know what I, what I was thinking of just really briefly as you were talking about like that that parenting plan and the agreements I don't know if you caught this but um there was a podcast I think it was last year excellent podcast with a, a family law attorney her name was Stephanie sure. Randall and it was like how to have an amicable divorce and she just provided so much really great information for people to be thinking about and just like ways of negotiating certain yeah. things like parenting plans in order to have it be as good as possible. So I'll just refer our listeners back to that. But what I heard you saying like emotionally and relationally for, for parents with kids is, um, and this is a really simplified way, I think of saying it, but it's like, no matter in, in some ways, like how bad things get for you and how bad you feel that your job as a parent is really to insulate your child from that as much as you possibly can being you know, very thoughtful and intentional about the things you share and having a well-developed way of managing all of these feelings outside of the relationship with your kid, but also like a high degree of emotional intelligence, like knowing this is a trigger for me and like, I'm not even going to try to do a drop-off in this situation because I know I'm going to lose it. And so like figuring out how you can solve the like practical situation without putting yourself in a vulnerable situation emotionally. Like there's so much there. Yeah. And I'll say we're not going to get it right all the time. Probably. And that's okay. And actually we can model really great behaviors for our kids in that too. Like Mm -hmm. let's say we did the drop off and you got really mad and we argued and you know, the kid, you could even go back to them and be like, gosh, you know what? I thought about it. And in our drop off, I got really mad that time. Like, did you see that? I had some big feelings too. Um, Or, you know, I was really angry and I didn't handle that quite the way that I wanted. And I'm sorry Mm -hmm. that you saw your parents fighting like that. And I want you to know that wasn't about you and that wasn't a you thing. I'm going to try to do it differently in the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry that I acted like that. Yeah, sometimes dad does make me mad, um, but that's okay. Um, We're going to figure out where we go from Mm -hmm. there. So being able to apologize or repair or kind of model that of, Yep, you're right. Sometimes we aren't going to do it perfect. Um, and that that's okay. Really, that goal is that we're trying our best to get there. We're, you know, doing our best and maybe it gets easier over time or we're a couple of years in and there's a thing. We're like, gosh, where did that come from? I thought those feelings were, yeah. weren't were there and that it's okay to figure that out. Um, and that we can always try again. There's always the next day and we can try again the next day. And that's an okay thing too. Oh, that's wonderful. I just, to to direct, you know, very directly and explicitly, like be creating emotional safety is by being authentic. Like, did you see me right there? Totally lost it. I would do that. And I'm, you know, acknowledging what that was like for the the child, but also um, modeling for the kid, how we repair Mm -hmm. times when maybe we did make a mistake. But so, okay. I am 
in the back of my mind right now, I'm I'm imagining that we have one of our listeners, like, you know, sitting with us right now in this conversation, who is one of these people who I know you and I have both worked with closely, Amy, over the years, who is in a situation where they have maybe grave misgivings about the way that their ex does parent. They don't trust their ex to meet their kids' needs. They're worried about their child in their, you know, part ex-partner's care. And and I think, you know, a lot of times parents who are divorcing, that right there is the hardest thing for them. Um because they have certain standards of parenting that maybe their ex isn't doing, or um, and maybe it's not even about, you know, feeding them candy and going to bed without brushing your teeth, but maybe the ex on the other side is actually bad-mouthing you to the kid and isn't trying to be as ethical emotionally with the children as you are being, and, you know, bad things are being said about you on the other side. Um, and again, this is a big topic and we're not going to like talk about all the everything in our, in our short time together. I know people spend months with you trying to unpack all this, but do you have any basic ideas or thoughts that might be helpful, even just as a starting point for someone who is in this reality where they're trying real hard for their kids and maybe their ex is slinging sauce and being mean and being questionable. Um, yeah. what, what do you do with that? It is so hard because on one hand, we can only control what we do. We can't yeah. make another person change, although sometimes that feels like it would be the easiest situation. And there's sort of two scenarios to describe. There's, there's mm-hmm. the one scenario of, I don't really like how this person parents too. Maybe I have disagreements about it. And you know, the first question is, you know, are your kids safe? Are they, and if the answer is that they're not safe, then that's all you should step in and do something and, you know, try to figure that out. Because we, as parents and professionals, you know, we want kids to be safe first and foremost. A lot of times though, kids are safe and we don't like what's going on, you know, bedtimes a lot later than we think it should be, or Mm -hmm. they're eating a lot more sugar, navigating. The kale is not organic. Yes. Something that goes Mm -hmm. on. And in those cases, it's sort of a, you know, let's pick our battles on that. If it's, you know, this diet really is important for some reason, maybe here it is. Well, maybe then we need to negotiate that. But if it's, you know, bedtime is seven versus 8 p.m. and we don't like that it's 8 p.m., but it's okay, then we pick our battles on that because Mm -hmm. you're probably going to parent differently um, in different households. And that gets even more complicated if somebody gets remarried or there's more kids Uh added into the mix. But But kids can kind of adapt between those two rules. Having routines or things for your own kids when they come home, like, you know, first night back, we do movie night or we're going to have that meal together or, you know, whatever those routines are that you Mm -hmm. can establish. It's really helpful to provide that consistency um, or expectation for kids if they know what's going to happen. Um, and that can even be maybe that's not being done on the other mm-hmm. side, but they know that routine's there with you. And that can be kind of yeah. grounding and helpful. So doing what you can and helping mm-hmm. that. Um, sometimes it can be, you know, I see it come up a lot of times of, are we going to church or not? And that can be mm-hmm. different. Or, you know, maybe we have different political things we're telling our kids about or different, those value differences can be really hard to hear. Mm-hmm. And your kids are probably going to experience that sometime in their life. So we can practice being like, yeah, you know, people really believe different things. And in this house, what we believe is this, um, and this is what we've really been doing. And you're right. That's different in that house. And that can be confusing. We need to talk about that more. Who can we find to talk about that? So sometimes that can be helpful. Sometimes um, there's the other thing that you mentioned was really when that parent is kind of bad mouthing you or they're not doing any of these things. Things. Right. Or using yeah. the kids emotionally or like doing all the, all things, the things that things. you said to not do, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we generally want to do is do the same thing back then to kind of defend ourselves. It makes sense yeah. of, well, they do that too, or, you know, kind of we... Let me tell you the truth. truth. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And what that does is it puts our kid in a very stuck position of having to choose sides. And kids don't want to pick sides. Um, and that's really, really tough. So being able to say, you know, 
the K, you know, came and they're like, well, so-and-so, you know, they said this and it, it doesn't even have to be the other parent. It could be another step parent or a grandparent or anyone involved could be saying, you know, kind of the negative things about you. Mm-hmm. You'd be like, you know, I really wish they hadn't said that to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. And the truth is that, you know, yeah, we do disagree a lot or, you know, mom and dad, we don't get along very well. But one thing that's true is that we're both trying to love you. Um, mm-hmm. Or if they brought up a situation like, oh, you don't like this or we can't do this because of you. Dad said that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you can own your truth and be like, gosh, you know, I don't know why dad would say that, but, but I love this or, you know, here's what I actually think is true for me. And then Mm -hmm. sort of period, stop, don't go to the, so your dad is wrong or they're saying that, but sort of owning our mom's wrong, you know, um, no, actually this is what's true. Um, and here, and sometimes we can even provide the data to choose it. Like, Mm-hmm. Well, you know, mom said we can't pay for, you know, the soccer game and be like, you know, you're right. I don't have the money for that. And that's really hard because sometimes money looks different. Um, so, you know, that's right. But it doesn't, it's not because I don't love you or is not because I don't want to, to pay for that? Um, it's just, I can't really afford that right now. Maybe we can think about how we could do it in the future. Mm-hmm. So being able to acknowledge what's true and what's your truth and providing that consistency and stability that you can do um, and kind of being there for that, Mm -hmm. recognizing, again, you probably need to go to that safe person to handle that. And sometimes while we want to be those people for our kids, getting a professional involved for your kids and getting them to see a therapist can also be helpful during that time, particularly in that high conflict Mm -hmm. to say, you know, you don't have to try to take care of mom or dad. This is an adult that's safe. Um, and you can talk to it and you can talk about mm-hmm. all of those confusing feelings. And that kid doesn't have to worry about hurting anybody's feelings then or saying the right. wrong thing. They just have a safe space and they can get the mm-hmm. coping tools and they can navigate it and they can be honest about what's coming up. And that can be really, really helpful for kids yeah. as well. Yeah, I, I could totally see. And that that would be definitely an argument. Yes, mm-hmm. get the kid therapy so that they don't have to try to take care of anybody emotionally and can just feel what they feel and figure out their own truth. Yeah. That's a good reminder. And um, yeah, oh gosh, just what a difficult situation though, emotionally. And and as I heard you talking about like how a, a thoughtful parent could handle those situations where maybe they are being bad-mouthed on the other side is that to balance, you know, how maybe good it feels to say, yeah, I can't pay for soccer because your father hid his retirement assets and when we, you know, like the whole truth versus this, this idea of it is not good for my kid to hear negative things about either of us. It's not good for my kid for me to say bad things about their, their other parent, even if I am completely justified in sure. you know, doing so like, and, and that would, you know, is, is something that can be challenging to kind of get to, but, but there's a, a, a sort of other corollary here. And, and I don't want to um, end our time together without talking about this just a little bit, because I know that, that parental alienation is a very real thing. I know you're an expert on this topic. And so, you know, this is a situation when there has been a lot of negativity or bad mouthing about one parent um, from the other, and it does have an impact. Can you say a little bit more about what, you know, parental alienation is and, yeah. you know, yeah. how to manage it? And that's, mm-hmm. It's a really tough area. And I'll say parental yeah. alienation exists on a spectrum. So often when we uh-huh. talk about it, we talk on like the worst case scenario situation of, you know, parents that are safe, good, loving parents that don't have any access, you know, to their children for some way, or the kid is sort of turned against them, even Mm -hmm. though they are a good, safe parent. So that's one sort of caveat when we're talking about it, that the parental alienation really only exists when there's two parents that should have contact with their Mm -hmm. children. So in situations where there was any abuse or neglect, that's not parental alienation to not, you know, have your kid have contact with them. That's being safe. And so it's one sort of definitional point is that it's between when there's two safe parents. Um, And that 
it can, you know, exist on any spectrum from that kind of bad mouthing and confusion creating. And that can go really big too to kids saying, well, I'm not going to go to your visitation or I'm not going mm-hmm. to do that. One of those things can, can be protective is again, going back to those, you know, legal orders that we have and those protected rights of saying, you know, you actually have to do this or this has to be done because, you know, sometimes what happens is you don't get to go to visitation or the kid doesn't, is going to say, I don't want to go or I don't want to answer the phone. And so the courts can be used as a way to kind of, mm-hmm. nope, this is the order. This is what we're doing. So yeah. having that safe ground and being intentional in how you create it mm-hmm. can help. Um, and navigating. Oh, like, yeah, mm-hmm. sorry. What were you going to say? Oh, oh no, go ahead. You could get into your thought. Oh, yeah. I, I blurt. That's I'm okay. An interrupter. I'm working on it. That's okay. I can be long winded. So <laughs> go we'll pick a good team. Um, but sort of navigating that support. Um, you know, there are cases I've worked with where people don't have, you know, contact with their kids at that point. And that is just heartbreaking to do. And, and sometimes, you know, the best we can do is try to be maintain that consistency. One of the things we know doesn't work is to do the same behaviors on the other end of things. And sometimes, you know, kids get to be adults or they can change in the future. Um, but recognizing that it, one, it's really hard and it's really yeah. tricky, trying to navigate that continual contact of I'm still here, I'm still, you know, showing up for you. And um, that looks different in different, you know, contexts of, you know, if there's a little kid versus a teenager mm-hmm. showing up might look very different. Um, mm-hmm. But often it's very, you know, let's go to the preventatives. Like, you know, can we figure out where that's coming from? Can we do some couples work together? Or if I'm just having that time, I can, you know, you can disagree with behaviors without bad mouthing another person and say, you know, I, I really wish, you know, mom or dad wouldn't say those things. Um, and I really hope that you can trust that what I'm telling you is what's true for me. We only get a say what's mm-hmm. true for ourselves. And so I want you to know that I love you and I care about you and I have fun. And so kind of providing that alternate balance to kids can be really helpful or not pushing back. You know, the kid says, I, you know, I don't want to see you um, right now saying, gosh, you know, it's, it's really hard to do these transitions, isn't mm-hmm. it? But right now it's our parenting time. So what are we going to do? And kind of navigating through that. Maybe figuring out, you know, if they say, you know, where's it coming from or handling here, that gives us ideas of how do we move forward. Um, but again, often that alienating back doesn't, doesn't work or it'll be met yeah. with that resistance or be used to confirm things even. Right. Um, and recognizing again that it's that full spectrum of anywhere. So they don't always all go to those worst case scenarios. And I think that's a helpful thing to remember that mm-hmm. they do and it's, tragic and awful when that happens and that they don't always or we can prevent it earlier on sometimes as well yeah yeah that that said that parental alienation is on on a spectrum there's sort of shades of gray and it's when um you know one parent uh is very negative towards the other and actually um influences the child <clears throat> to think badly about the other parent to the point where it impacts their ability to have a relationship with that other parent. Um, and I've heard some people saying it's like, it feels like they're brainwashing my kid. They're yeah. turning them against me, like all this. And, and so you're saying to not, not, you know, use the same tactics about mm-hmm. trying to talk back, but just really consistently like sticking to the visitation as much as possible. And if the child is, you know, maybe like a teenager or something, mm-hmm. it's like, no, I'm not getting in the car to yeah. just find ways of of just consistently showing up to the degree that you can so that your kid knows that you're not giving up on them, you're still there. And that even if right now they might be under the influence of somebody who's highly negative, um, you know, they'll they'll grow up and and maybe have the opportunity to re-engage and and yeah. um make up their own minds. Is that yeah. Yeah. did I summarize that? I mm-hmm. think that's great. And I would also say in those cases, get support for yourself oh, yeah. as well, because there's so much outside of your control mm-hmm. and there is so much grief and pain. And I, to go through those experiences, that's traumatic for a parent. Mm-hmm. And to have that support in place for you 
as well is so important to be able to just Mm -hmm. because it's confusing and it's disorienting and it's a loss. And so I think that it's really important to be able to have your personal support system, do the things Mm -hmm. that are right for you as well, but also have that sort of professional area where you can get that support um, and Mm -hmm. guidance and, you know, have that space for yourself is really important too. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever seen, um, I haven't, but I'm wondering if you have, because you have more experience than I have in this area. Uh, So if there is a dynamic where one parent Mm -hmm. is really highly negative about the other, you know, Mm -hmm. your father is the devil and is really like using their kids and manipulating their kids emotionally in an unhealthy way. Have you ever seen the parent on the other side um, be able to make contact Mm -hmm. with the parent who is being really destructive in a way that is able to help that destructive parent understand what they're doing or work through the anger and pain that may be at the root of the the lashing out and the negativity. Is there anything you've seen that works? Because that's like the the source, Mm -hmm. right? Or is it just... Yeah, I think that mm -hmm. it doesn't always hurt to try. Sometimes it gets so complicated in these cases of is it just from the other parent, but there's so many other people, you know, it can happen from a step parent, bad mouthing mm-hmm. someone or a grandparent or some, some of it's sort of where is it coming from? Some of it's the, why is it coming from? And sometimes it's, do we not know? Is it intentional? Where is that? So um, I think every person probably knows their situation better than I can hypothesize right mm-hmm. now for each person listening, but being able to say, you know, does it feel like reaching out or even saying like, you know, I don't know that we're doing this co-parenting thing. Well, can we get some help on how we do it better or, mm-hmm. you know, navigating those systems sometimes works well. Sometimes those, you know, maybe they didn't listen to the podcast or they don't have those information and it's not an intentional thing right. to happen. So they often, don't know yeah, yeah how, how destructive it is. They yeah. don't know. Yeah. So a lot of times when it's, I'll say an, I don't know, or I'm coping poorly those cases, make, there could be a lot of potential mm-hmm. for that. There are also cases if we go to that more extreme end where it is more intentional in nature or maybe not always intentional consciously, but like we're really doing this or I want that custody or different things that happen in those cases. Mm-hmm. And probably there'd be less success in those areas if someone's trying to do it. So I'll say, again, it's very complex and there's so much... Um, different layers or different ways. I'd say no two cases really look alike, but Mm -hmm. being able to kind of figure out what's your area and what's the sort of step forward that's going to work for you and trying to understand that is so key um, to do and trying to um, recognize that not everyone's story, you know, you can go onto Google and you see all the horror stories, but you also see all the great stories and recognizing Mm -hmm. that that support is wonderful and like finding that support for yourself and Mm -hmm. seeing like, just because that's what this person experienced doesn't mean it's going to be what I'm going to experience and kind of holding that balance perspective for yourself as well. Yeah. No, I, I hear what you're saying. And we can certainly find the darkest of the dark yeah. where there's power sure. and control and narcissists intentionally mm-hmm. manipulating things. And so that's, yeah, d- 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 a thing, a thing all of its own. Um, but maybe a note to end on. Um so certainly if, you know, listening to podcasts like this around what is actually best for kids emotionally when you're going through this and just helping people become educated and how to manage their own feelings in a way that helps their child, even if they're hurting, that would be a start. Um, and and on that note, do you have like other books or resources that other people, um, where people listening could kind of learn more about these topics? So, you know, how to be safe emotionally for kids, um, any other information on, you know, the um, impact of, I, I want to say negativity on children and, and you know, sort of healthy boundaries for people in these situations, like yeah. you might even send to an ex in the mail or something. What sure. what are books or resources would you recommend? Yeah. Um, and I'll certainly send you a list versus like the ones that just pop into my mind. You can link yeah, it with the awesome. little storybooks too. I think that um, often there's some good websites looking at sort of any of re- there's a lot of parenting data out there that's not really research-based. 
So mm-hmm. going with the ones that are really rooted in research tends to be the best. Yeah. So a, a blogger with a strong opinion is not always the <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. The okay. Basic. Um, I think that a lot that have you know developmental perspectives can be really mm-hmm. helpful because the way you're going to talk to a four year old is going to look very different than an eight or nine year old versus a. 13 year old versus a 19 year old. And so divorce can impact kids very differently at different ages. So when you're looking for those resources, really wanting to be like, I'm not reading a book about divorcing with an elementary school kid. If I have high schoolers, yeah. um, it's going to be different. So if you have like three different ages of kids, you might want to read three different books on how to support mm-hmm. kids differently. Um, a lot of that sort of, I would say that the emotional intelligence parenting too, or I'm sort of looking into those resources are helpful for any parent and being able to have these emotion conversations, but they tend to be really helpful in guiding it about how do we talk to kids yeah. about divorce. So, um, but I can certainly send over a list of like specific titles and things. So um, if you want to link that too, it would be great. Wonderful. I, I will, I will put your reading list in the show notes of today's episode and that will be on growingself.com. And we're going to be calling this episode divorce and children. So it'll be growingself.com forward slash divorce hyphen and hyphen children. And I'll be sure to put links to your recommended books and articles. Um, But Amy, thank you so much again, just for taking the time to talk through all this with me. I know it's a complex subject, but you shared so much information in such a short amount of time. And and I know it was helpful for a lot of people listening. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me and to everyone listening. I just also want to say like, I really commend you for even taking that first step to get the information and resources. Like the fact that you clicked on a podcast to listen to it says that you really want to be there for your kids and to do that. So hopefully there's been some good advice or some good resources or even food for thought about next steps. Um, But just, I think that even listening to the podcast and wanting to get that resource says that you care a lot about your kids. And so I just want to share that too. But Dr. Lisa, thank you so much for having me as well. It was an honor to be able to be here today. Mm, this was fun and, and ditto yeah yay yay to you mom or dad for for trying so hard i just amy thank you so much for saying that so beautiful thank you thank you